I want to say Merry Christmas again this evening. This evening, I don't have a specific text for you. I don't have anywhere for you to turn in your Bibles tonight. I'm going to be reading the text as we go. I just want you to sit back, relax, and and listen. What was Christmas like for you growing up? What was your experience like? I, I didn't have the perfect childhood, but one thing that my parents always did every year is they gave us a lot of presents on Christmas Day. It was like clockwork, our routine, every single year. The beginning of December, there's a few presents under the tree. Mid-December, we get to open an early Christmas present. But then on Christmas Eve, something magical would happen. We'd go from having some presents under the tree to the next day, Christmas morning, having a lot of presents under the tree. It would triple or even quadruple. And I I remember that I was so excited knowing that this was going to happen every year that I'd go to our tree at one or two in the morning and I would just stare at all the presents that I was going to open and just think, this is so amazing. But it's a two-edged sword, isn't it, being up at 1 a.m. on Christmas morning? Because then you got to wait five hours and you can't sleep afterwards. But what I would do right at about 5.30 is I would start being really loud in the house so my parents would have to get up and, and come open the presents. Don't do that to your parents, guys. But even today, whether it's just my family tradition, nostalgia, whatever, I still enjoy waking up Christmas morning and opening a gift, no matter the cost, no matter the value. I just enjoy the the tradition of opening presents on Christmas morning. And I want to ask tonight, do you think that enjoying material gifts are superficial or wrong in and of itself? I'm sure most of us would answer no right away. But for many of us, we don't stay consistent with that belief. For many of us, for Christians, our ultimate goal in life is to leave behind all things physical, all things material, and go live forever in a bodiless state up in the cloud somewhere. We're going to leave behind all the physical things of the world and never look back. And I do not tonight want to bore you with Greek philosophy and ancient heresy, so I won't. I'll just quickly say that the idea that physical things, the things we can see, the things we can touch, the things we can taste, that comes from, that that stuff is evil, that the material world is evil, that comes from Gnosticism and Greek philosophy. But we can't allow that, that belief, to influence our understanding of the world and of Scripture if it's not consistent with Scripture. What does Scripture say? Are material things good? Are physical things good and okay for us to enjoy? Physical things like presents on Christmas Day. Well, one thing that should just be a knockout short answer is that God created the world. He created a physical world. He created a world of mountains. He created a world of lakes and trees. He gave us all a world that has all the kinds of raw materials for us to create everything we see today. This podium, this, this carpet, all the pews you're sitting in, all, God gave us all the raw materials to take these things and reflect his image and create. We make cars. 
We make cell phones, we make TVs, and a seeming, seemingly endless amount of other things that make our lives easier and more enjoyable. And this world that God created, he said, it is good. The physical world is good. Now Paul, he picks up this theme in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Listen to what he says. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. So this idea that the world is bad, the physical world is evil, and we need to escape it, that's simply not of Scripture. So enjoying gifts and exchanging gifts with your friends and family on Christmas Day is, is not a bad thing. But what's the problem with almost every physical gift that we receive? They're things often that we just want. They're not things that we need. There is a gift that we all need. I'm sure many of my Bible scholars out there know what happens in Genesis 3. We have a fallen and broken world through the sin of Adam and Eve that tells us that we, all the suffering, all the diseases, everything that we're experiencing today that we don't like, it's the result of a broken and fallen world. Adam and Eve, humans, our ancestors, they decided that they could rule the world on their own apart from God. And that's why there's darkness, misery, and suffering. And as another result of this, all of creation, the physical world, is rotting and going into decay and in corruption. My question for you is, because we've rebelled, what should God have done with us and the world? I want to say that it would have been completely right, entirely just of God, to simply leave us on our own, in our own misery. It would have been perfectly fine for him to allow us to just be lost forever. How many of us desire to help someone who has wronged us? It's hard. People do things to us, they say things about us, they say things to us, and doing something for people that do bad things against you or even hate you, that's a very difficult thing. But God's not like us. God looked down at our world and instead of doing away with the world, he decides that he's going to rescue, redeem, and renew the world. And his plan to save the world comes by sending one person, one person, one person who is able to set the world back on track, one person who was foreshadowed and prophesied about throughout all of Scripture. Scripture says he will crush the serpent. He will be Isaac's substitutionary sacrificial lamb. He will be the true Passover lamb. He will embody the old covenant law. He will be the sum and substance of all the Old Testament sacrifices. He's the great eternal high priest. He's the one who spoke to Moses face to face in the tent of meeting. He's the commander of the army of the Lord in Joshua. He's the fourth man inside the fire in the book of Daniel. He's the Prince of Peace, the Alpha and Omega. 
He's eternally worshiped in Isaiah. He will attract the nations to Yahweh like a light. He will be the embodiment of true righteousness and purity. He will be the embodiment of wisdom literature, Proverbs personified. He will launch the new creation. He will be the true Davidic king after God's own heart. He will rule the nations with a rod of iron. He's the suffering servant, a man of great sorrow. He's the human sitting on the eternal throne in Ezekiel. He's the son of man in the book of Daniel. He will carry our curses upon himself. He's the king of the resurrection in Hosea. He's the true temple of God who will bring the true eternal Sabbath rest. In all, that's just a little bit. All of the Old Testament points out that this coming one cannot simply be only a human. All humans fail. Abraham lied and doubted God's promises. Moses disobeyed God. David was an adulterer and murderer. The only one that matches all of the descriptions I just named off, the only person that can succeed where everyone else has failed is God himself. God becoming a human, the immaterial God becoming a human and having a physical body. And that's what we're celebrating on Christmas. We're celebrating that our God didn't leave us to ourselves. If you look at all the other religions in the world, what do they do? They put God high up on this high pedestal and they give you a rule book and say, figure out how to get yourself to God. But the Christian religion is the only one that teaches that God comes down to us. He came to us in the night, in the flesh, as a baby boy. He came to experience our misery and to carry our curse upon himself. He lies in the manger. Can't even hold his head up, yet controls everything in the universe. His arms are one day going to grow. And they're going to be stretched out on a tree on top of Calvary. He'll do that, and he has done that, to pay for our sins so that we can have a relationship with him. He did it to rid the world of its suffering, to put an end to disease and death. If you believe in Jesus, you are going to relive in a renewed physical world. There will be no more wars. There will be no talks of antichrist, no whispers of one world governments. There will be no more fighting on social media. It'll be a world where we never have to deal with anything like a coronavirus. There'll be no more corrupt leadership and there will never be an issue of injustice. Everything will be put right. 
And we will be in the presence of God reflecting on him for eternity. And we will reflect his image as we create things. We will build cities, come up with new tools and inventions to explore God's creation. But one of the best gifts is that we'll be free from sin. Let's embrace God's wonderful gift of the physical world as well as the gifts within the world this Christmas. But let us never, even for a moment, forget that the greatest gift that we have this Christmas and every day is the gift of God himself. He is the ultimate reward for believing the gospel. He is our greatest gift. This Christmas, I pray, if you haven't already, that you'll joyfully accept the gift of God himself. I just wish that so many years ago, when I was so excited about all those presents under the tree, that I truly knew what my greatest gift was. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the gift of your son. Thank you for this baby, fully human, fully God, being our representative as a human, doing the things that we can't, living a perfect life as a human, suffering and dying as a human in our place. And doing what only God can do. I pray these things to you. And we ask you that we would all experience the joy that you brought to the world this Christmas. Amen.